I'm Elise Orlowski, a senior video director here at Kramer. And I'm Trip Underwood, a creative director at Kramer. And at Kramer, we work with so many incredibly fascinating people from all over multiple industries. We have so many great conversations, many that are just too good to keep to ourselves. So now we're sharing them with the world. Right here from Kramer Studios. This is Pivot Points. Cut. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Pivot Points. Today, I'm really, really excited about our conversation. You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion have been in the spotlight for a while now, but today we're going to focus on how you can discuss DEI with your teams, as well as considering what you can do to plan for your next event. And today, I'm joined by Patrick Martin, um, partner of Business Solutions. And Pat, you've been an advocate here at Kramer for DEI for a long time now. Can you tell me a little bit more? Sure, absolutely. Uh, DEI is something I am very passionate about. Something we've been focusing a lot of our attention on here at Kramer. Uh, we do it not only just to better ourselves and society, but you know, equally as important, you know, how do how do we use DEI to uh, improve the solutions that we're delivering to our clients? So, as event strategists, you know, what should we be considering when we're consulting with our clients? So, we decided it would be best to turn to an expert for the answers. For our um, guest today, I know that you've worked with her directly, which is really exciting. <laughs> yes, I've been very fortunate to work with Jackie Cranford, principal of Cranford Advisory Services. She has over 20 years of experience working with clients on talent management. Management, showing companies how they can better implement DEI. Jackie, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us today. Hello, Jackie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation because you know I'm very passionate about these issues and happy to be here. Yeah, well, we're very, very excited to have you. I think you have a ton of experience, so we're really excited to pick your brain today. Um, but kind of starting off, I think, you know, continually we know that you're working with companies to better implement. DEI into the work that they do. From what you've noticed in the industry, what are some key areas that you think are holding organizations back? So when I think about key areas, there's so many that come to mind, but in the interest of time, I'll focus on just a few. It's a magnum opus. One, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So in the short time we have, let's think about some of the things that I see repeatedly. And, and one of the things that often holds companies back is that people just don't really understand how DE&I impacts them personally and their team and their organization. I read an article recently about a study that was done in 2021 because, you know, in 2020, 2021, we saw quite an uptick in focus on DEI. And in this article, it was really fascinating to read that 93% of leaders thought that DEI should be on the agenda and it was a priority. Mm. And at the same time, only 34% believe that it made an impact on their company. Really? So, Only 34%? Yeah. Fascinating. Right, right. So when you see that disconnect that people are saying, we believe in DE&I, and yet when it comes down to it, when you ask them, well, what difference does it make for you and your company? Not many people know the answer to that. So that gets in the way of progress, frankly. Absolutely. I can totally see that. I mean, I just know mm -hmm. from working with our teams here, the benefit of DE&I is that we're solving more difficult problems. We're trying to come up with better yeah. solutions for our clients. And so yeah. the more voices we can have at the table that come from different places and have different perspectives, the better our solutions are going to be for our clients. Oh, absolutely. And Jackie, would you say, are there any misconceptions that you found as well? I know you kind of touched on that, but are there any misconceptions when it comes to DE&I that you've faced? Again, so many. Like, yes. said, oh, yeah. There are so many. Right? And like high level, because um, I know it's such a big... Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So high level. One of the things that I notice with a lot of organizations is that they'll bring in DEI expertise. They might stand up a DEI committee or task force. And some, particularly over the last two years, will establish a position. And then they delegate responsibility for DEI to mm. their DEI professional, right? And DEI is a team sport. Right. It takes all of us to come to the table with our ideas so mm. that we can better come up with solutions. Right. It's not just the responsibility of one person or an external person or a committee to do all the work. So I think that misconception sort of gets in the way of how we move forward. Um, and the other thing that goes along with that, how we move forward, what I notice is people kind of get this idea that, all right, 
DEI is big. I know people are doing things. Mm. What are the best practices, right? Oh, yeah. What are the best practices? Yes. Yeah, so, it's become trendy. You know, <laughs> yes, it's trendy. Everybody's doing it. What are they doing? What's the other company that I compete with doing? What are my peers doing? And the problem with that is every company, every team needs to take a deep look at what are our issues? What are our DEI priorities? And then figure out what we're going to do about our specific issues, be very targeted in what we're doing rather than trying to take best practices from everybody all around, right? So that gets in the way, right? We want to make sure that we're really focused on our own issues. And then we're solving for our own issues, or as I often say, solving for the right problem. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it definitely starts from the small to the big, not yes. trying to fix in something with like a Band-Aid or anything like that. And I'm curious, right. Right. you know, we're, you're kind of talking about how DE&I is trendy and it's something that's hot mm-hmm. right now, but how do you feel mm-hmm. like we can really make it so it's sustainable and it's a long-term solution, yeah. not a short-term solution? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things is to be strategic mm-hmm. for organizations to really think about why we're doing this and what are we doing? And what is our long-term vision? So if we don't establish a vision, where is our organization going to be in X number of years? What is our vision for DEI? And then we work toward that vision with our strategy, with our goals, with our action steps, right? Very focused. Mm. Then we can move forward. And it's sustainable because we, we know what we're doing. And we are measuring ourselves against what we're doing. So it's not just an initiative here, an initiative there. Let's just do this trendy thing. But it's here's our strategy over X number of years. And every year and every point along the way, we're going to check in and see how we've done, you know, measure ourselves against our strategy, make tweaks if necessary, but keep the momentum moving forward, moving toward that goal, that vision. Yeah, it sounds like it's, again, like a very long-term solution. And if it Mm -hmm. is meant to be a quick solution, it's probably not going to be sustainable. But if you're really in it for the long haul, and even just take the time, I think it takes time to examine your organization, examine your people, and where their changes need to be made, ultimately, then it's going to really sustain in the long run. I love the comment, too, about measurement. That's Mm. something that comes up with our clients all the time is, you know, how do you measure and what are the right, you know, metrics? And, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about is how this new evolution of uh, hybrid events Mm. uh, has opened up so many new, you know, metrics because we can be more inclusive, you know, globally now to people that, you know, may not have been able to have access to, uh, you know, to join a particular event. Um, And, you know, through those registrations over time, we can see, you know, the audience and how it's changing and what their interests are. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious, when looking at DE&I, how important would you say is there to recognize the difference between equity and the difference in inclusion? Because they're they're one and the same, but also very different. They work together, but also they're not the same thing. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. They're partners. But it's interesting when you were talking, it's like people say DE&I as if it's one thing. Right. Right, We just kind of run it together. Right. Mm -hmm. But it is important. So I really appreciate your asking that question, because one of the things that I will start with with the client is defining diversity, equity and inclusion. So I know you ask about inclusion and equity. I want to add diversity into that just to give a bigger picture, like what are all these things and how distinguishable they are. So, you know, I start with diversity because years ago I was traveling around the world doing training and I would ask the question and whenever I got a response, it could be so many different things Mm. so when we right so when people think about diversity they're really thinking about what are the many differences who's in the room uh they're counting heads right who's represented Mm -hmm. which is something that you definitely need to think about particularly when you're planning events right and then we have to think about inclusion so we might have a lot of difference in our midst we might have a lot of different people representing different identity groups but what is the experience the inclusion experience And by that, I mean, when people feel included, it's, do I feel like I am respected? Mm. I'm expected to be here. I'm represented. I am heard. I'm integrated. I'm actually a part of what's going on here, not just here counted as one of me. You're not just a number and a percentage, but you're really like represented and included in the conversation. Yes. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, when we think about equity, one of my clients recently said, well, aren't they the same, right? Mm. To your question, aren't equity and inclusion the same? And they really are not. So when I think about inclusion, I think about the experience as I just described. But when I think about equity, I think about what are the skills that each one of us need, particularly if we're in a leadership position, to make sure that we are noticing who's here. Mm. We are noticing how we can integrate them, right? Where, you know, where do I meet them? Yeah, at the point of, you know, how do they enter our organization? And it's not about how can I help them, but it's like meeting people at the point of their need, noticing where they are, and then meeting them there so that you can give them access, equitable access to what what's going on, what you brought them into your organization to do. You're making sure that they have the tools to do what you've hired them to do. Yeah. And it's right. And it's important to think about mindset because often people are like, you know, I'm going to help these people. Right. But instead, if I am equitable, I'm thinking about everybody where they are. And I'm thinking about how I can facilitate their ability to do their job because they have Mm. the ability. Yeah. One of the right. Let me just give an example of how this really came a home for me. I speak at a lot of conferences, particularly pre-COVID, a lot of conferences. And there was one conference, um, I was there to speak. And when I go to a conference to speak, I don't have to think about how am I going to get up on the stage and will I be able to see over the podium? I'm taller than the average person and I'm able-bodied. So I walk up on the stage and I deliver the presentation I'm there to give. Well, at this conference, there was a gentleman who was there who was paraplegic he was, I'm sorry, he was quadriplegic, actually, wow. um, in a wheelchair. He was a wheelchair user, and he gave the most powerful testimony and explanation of equity I've heard, and that is this. He said, I am asked to speak, and I want to be able to do what I'm here to do. When people see me in my wheelchair, they often offer to push me, mm. but I don't need to be pushed, right? I can operate this wheelchair. It's built for me. Mm-hmm. But what I do need is I need people to think about making sure that I can access the stage, making sure that I can access the room, right? So don't offer to push me, just give me a ramp and I will go up there and I will deliver my speech. So when we think about equity, think about that picture. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's yeah. awesome. And where would you say in event in the event space in terms of messaging, the actual event, yeah. like you were kind of talking about, there's opportunities mm-hmm. for change to be had? Yeah, so many opportunities. I think that example is one great one. How accessible are the spaces we're using? Mm. And am I thinking through the many barriers that might be there? I might not even think about barriers. Like I said, in my example, I don't think about walking up on the stage. I just go and I do it. It's not my experience. But once I start to pay attention and learn and even invite different voices, back to what you were saying earlier, Patrick, a lot of different voices, a lot of different ideas help us to innovate, help us to think about what's needed, and then help us to be able to deliver, mm. right? So that's one way to make immediate change. Invite voices and say, what is it that we need to think through? What is it that we might be missing? We want to hear from you and we want to make change. So that's a great starting point, right? I love that. And it's it's the small things, you know, it doesn't mm-hmm. always have to be, you know, a, a big thing. It's just yeah. even, yeah. you know, how yes. we address the audience at the beginning of a show when the voice mm. of God comes on yeah. it, you know, ladies yes. and gentlemen, yes. please take your seats. Yes. Like maybe it's, you know, everyone, everyone, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, yeah. thank you for being yeah. here. Yeah. We're so excited. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Please take your seats, you know, mm-hmm. so it's just yeah. making small changes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, language is so important. Like you were just saying. As I think about this issue, and it's an area where I am continually trying to grow, which means I need to do more research, but Mm -hmm. our language is evolving. And the more we know, the more we realize some of our language is just not inclusive. And once we know it, we have an opportunity to make a change, right? So just even thinking about saying participants instead Mm -hmm. of ladies and gentlemen, right? In that example. Or saying, you know, can I get everyone's attention? Whatever the case is, really thinking through our words. Are we using inclusive language? That's an immediate step that we all can take just to start to think about. Is our language ableist? 
Is it sexist? Mm. Because so much of our language is it's ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, men and women. I was just on an event last night on a Zoom and they were saying the attire for the men is this. The attire for the women is that. Mm. And I just had to say, what about non-binary individuals? Are we even thinking about yeah. everyone? Right. Yeah. So. No, I love that. And I think as we kind of close out, I know D&I is a huge, huge magnum opus of things, and we could probably talk about this for like two hours. But it can also be really intimidating. I think a lot of people can feel... And I, yeah, like, am I going to be an yeah. imposter? I don't feel like yeah. I'm qualified. Should I just be silent and let other people kind of take the wheel, which obviously we don't want either? What advice yeah. would you give to companies yeah. or people that are kind of feeling this fear of getting into this space? Yes. What, what yeah. kind of wisdom would you offer them? I would say all of us are having some fear around these issues, right? I have been in this space for many, many years. And there are areas where I feel quite conversant on maybe Mm. gender or race or ethnicity. I'm still learning in terms of gender identity. And so I'm a little trepidatious when I enter a conversation because I want to make sure I'm using the right words and I don't say the the wrong thing. Well, what all of us need to do is be open to listening and to do some own, our, of our own personal work. Yeah. There's plenty of information out there mm-hmm. that we can read. Right? When we think about language, even a quick Google search of inclusive language is a great starting point to think about how do we talk about issues in a way that we don't exclude people. So if everybody's doing a little bit of, or a lot, of their own personal work, and as an organization, we set a foundation for having conversations on these issues. And I will say over the last two years, more and more organizations have opened the door saying, this is a safe space. Bring your questions, bring your concerns. Let's talk about it as a community. Yeah. We can't, right? These things are impacting us in the workplace. We can't act like we can leave our lives, our identities at the door and come into the workplace and be productive. So as leaders, as organizations, if we can say, we want to create a safe space for conversation, and that means we need to show each other some grace. Mm. I'm asking for grace. Yeah, right? and <laughs> totally. I'm offering grace. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, it's just setting that atmosphere that we're going to have this conversation. We're going to show each other grace and we're going to learn and grow together. We as an organization are committed to DEI. And that means we need to have some challenging conversations and we are open to doing that and we're encouraging you to do that. That's awesome. I love that. I feel like ultimately it's just a lot of humility too, (laughs) being like, I don't have all the answers and I'm not like even the experts, like you're saying, you're an expert and you're still learning. You're still kind of, you know, being able to be malleable and change your perspective. And I think that's super, super important. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for being here today. I feel like we could talk for like another two hours about this, but we really appreciate your wisdom and your expertise in this issue. Um, And I know Kramer will also be having some documents that we'll be putting in the description below of other ways where we can amplify diverse voices as well. Absolutely. And I will also just wanted to give a quick plug to Cranford Advisory Services. Thank you so much for, you know, all the help that you've been giving Kramer and uh, to anyone else out there that's, uh, you know, looking for some more um, perspective, you know, highly recommend, you know, Jackie and her team. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, thank you, Jackie, for being here today. And thank you for everyone listening to our conversation today. Catch us again for another Pivot Points episode.